Hello and welcome to the Albion Obsessed podcast. You join us after a defeat to Manchester City. But before we dissect the performance yesterday at the Etihad, let's see who we've got on the show today. We welcome Joe. Joe, my friend, how are you? <sighs> Good to be back, Tom. Good to be back. Or is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm all good, mate. How are you? Yep, not too bad. Not too bad. Recovering from COVID, which is my the third time I've had it. It has not been a fun experience this third time around, I can tell you. Um, but less about that and more about Dagan. Dagan, welcome back. International break is over. The Premier League football is back. How are you? Doing quite well. Doing quite well, honestly. Uh, not not overly bothered by yesterday. Uh, could have obviously been much worse. The The tough part is I think it could have been a little bit better, and that's disappointing. But otherwise, I'm okay. Fan Don Tastic. How are you, Tom? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. And, and I think I'm going to have a, a less than positive spin on yesterday's um performance. But we'll get into that in just a minute. Off air, myself and Dagan were... We're about to not go to loggerheads, but Joe had to be like, hit record, hit record. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into it in just a moment. Um, I want to start off, Joe, by talking about um, some pre-match comments that Pep Guardiola made about Roberto De Zerbi. Um, Pep has been very open with his admiration of Roberto De Zerbi. He said that he's changed the game. And he's apparently even said to backroom staff at Manchester City that one day, Roberto De Zerbi will manage Manchester City, as well as the as the fact that he is turning Brighton into a top team. Now, Joe, many consider Pep to be the single greatest manager of all time. And so that's some pretty impressive words coming out of his mouth hole to describe our head coach. There's no debating that Pep Guardiola is an elite coach. Um and when he speaks so highly of your football club and of your manager that you sit there and really take it in and appreciate it. Um, obviously, the, the comments of he's the next City boss are not music to Brighton fans' ears at all, although we're not deluded enough to think that if Roberto De Zerbi continues to do so well for us that he will move on at some point, just like Graham Potter did. Um, but yeah, it's it's just nice to hear Tom. Um, and you know, we're, we're very lucky uh, to, to have someone who's so highly thought of uh, by such an elite person in football. Yeah, it is true. And I think many uh, Brighton fans, you know, have rightly hit the nail on the head um, when they talk about Roberto De Zerbi being the best coach uh, Brighton have ever had. Um, now, Dagan, it wouldn't be a Brighton and Hope Albion game this season without many, 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 many changes. Let's talk about some of the changes to the starting eleven to the side that drew with Liverpool. We made three changes from that side. In come Danny Welbeck, Jason Steele and your good friend, James Milner. Out go Bart Bruggen, Joel Veltman and Evan Ferguson. Now, Dagan, you've had some choice words to uh, discuss on James Milner at fullback. Um, what did you think when you saw his name on the team sheet yesterday? I, I was furious. I was furious. There's no other way to put it. It was complete and instant disappointment. Um, I, I don't think he's up for it against most Premier League teams. Anyone who's seen Doku run not not even play the sport but just just run maybe dribble with the ball a little but there there was no way that was going to end well there was no way it was going to end well it i don't understand it i i love our manager i trust our manager i don't understand the decision making it genuinely makes me wonder if it's not to say we are inept at this position please get me someone because we need someone because that is not that is not the answer we have veltman veltman is better Beltman does well typically against that exact type of player um, and did better by being – Veltman does a great job of being physical early, not physical late, right? He causes the problem before it's a problem for him. Um, 
Milner sort of plays the perfect defensive position, rotates his hips and looks like he's doing all the right things and gets torched. Um, and then again, looking punchless in the first half, not a coincidence that Welbeck is up top. Like these two things have, I've been saying since last year um, with respect to gross at right back. Um, and then, and then with Welbeck Milner is, is significantly worse because he offers less, in attack than gross does obviously i'd rather have gross it right back than milner and then we'd have gilmore and Baleba in the middle which we'll talk more about those two later but yeah displeased steel verbruggen change is fine i'm okay with those guys sharing time i think you know they're i maybe like verbruggen better overall but i, I thought steel didn't hurt us at all yesterday if anything he saved a couple that might have gone in otherwise so hats off to him but uh you know, well, well back coming up injured. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what that does to our striker rotation going forward. Um, but yeah, as for, as for this lineup, I was not optimistic from the start. Yeah. And we are going to talk about those injury situations uh, a bit later on because, uh, some big concerns, uh, through the squad. Now, Joe, um, I don't want to labor too much on the starting 11. Um, and I certainly don't want to seem like I'm trying to cause a pile on here in regards to James Milner at fullback. However, we saw against West Ham uh, the fragility we had with Milner at right back. Um, and fans were quite vocal on um, social media, criticising and questioning Milner's inclusion in that fullback position, uh, myself included. And um, and many people like to say things like, oh, but you're not a UEFA qualified coach. What do you know? Um, do you think fans have a right to question and query, as long as it's done, of course, in a sensible way? Uh, why else do we watch the bloody sport? What do, are we meant to sit there silently? Does that mean you're not allowed to praise when things go well? Because if 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 you find that, oh, he's a really good player, you can't make that opinion because you're not a UEFA pro coach. It's It baffles me when people say that you're not allowed to have an opinion because you're not qualified to do so. We watch the sport because we love the sport. We pay our money to follow this team, whether that's £10 up to however much people spend on away days. You are allowed an opinion if you want to follow this football club, if you want to be a fan of this football club. I don't buy the whole, you know, you can't say this because of that. Um, and it it just it just baffles me. And, and as Dagan was pointing out, if, if you're on, on audio, he was saying we have we all have eyes, right? We, we can all watch this thing um, happen in front of us. Um, and as I say, why else do we watch football? is to have an opinion and, and to have a community around us and to chat about it afterwards. So yeah, for me, it's a non-star. And for those, for those who lack vision, hearing the sound of city's crowd, every time Doku touched the ball because they knew something exciting was about to happen. You didn't need to even see it. You could hear it. You could hear their excitement and what would have been our fans terror. Every time Milner was faced with Doku, I just thought I would add that for those who might be visually impaired. I think they knew too. And of course, I mean, one of the things that I pointed out was that we saw against West Ham Milner's, uh, well, less than stellar performance at right back. And um, I used that as a bit of a, well, we've seen it happen against pacey wingers before. It didn't go very well. Um, it's probably not going to go very well. Now, of course, I, I'm i very much against, obviously, just, you know, going, oh, and excuse the profanity. Oh, so-and-so shit. Oh, we're going to get relegated. I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I, that's nonsensical. It's immature, and I've got no time for it. But if you are tuned in, listener, hoping to hear that, oh, it all went very well yesterday, um, perhaps best turn off now, because we will be critical at points, we will be realistic at points. This isn't just a massive love in. Of course, it's our quote unquote job to dissect the game in an honest way. Well, so I'm if... not paid enough for this, Tom. I'm not paid <laughs> enough. God. 
ain't that the truth? But I, again, I don't want to. I don't want to give the impression that I'm trying to pile on uh, James Milner. Milner is obviously a fantastic professional. He brings an awful lot to our dressing room um, with his experience. However, I do think it's fair that fans were very critical and questioned his inclusion at right back. And I do understand, um, you know, the fact that we're playing Ajax on Thursday probably wants to give Veltman a rest. I, I understand that. Um, I just think there are better options. And we'll talk about those um, a bit later on on both fullback positions. Um, but let's talk about the actual game then, shall we? Now, the game almost started very well for us, Dagan. We had an early free kick. Uh, and Pascal Gross put in a lovely ball, which Matoma and Welbeck seemed completely unaware of. Um, and it was an early opportunity to to get a chance, a shot on goal to test their goalkeeper. Um, did that early chance going begging um, set the tone for the rest of the half for you, Dagan? Well, you know, I think at that moment you may not have thought how scarce those chances would be but they proved to be very scarce in, in the opening half. Um, almost everything was created out of some version of Matoma on the left wing trying to break things down and often being successful. I, mean, I, I thought Matoma looked himself yesterday. Um, you know, obviously wasn't clinical in finishing, but in terms of just his his movement, he, he looked like himself. There are some days where it looks like he doesn't quite have that spring in his step um, when he's had a long run of games. And I thought yesterday – he had that that bounce and that shift um, that makes him so dangerous, even if he's not finishing. Um, obviously, a couple of chances I wish he'd have done a little better with, um, either maybe playing across or instead of shooting. Uh, but again, <laughs> I knew it was on the other side of the pitch, so I that that one early chance did not give me any increased optimism. Um, but it was maybe a more important chance than it seemed at the time. Yeah, as you say, chances at the Etihad are often going to be at a, at a premium. Um, so when you get an early opportunity to test the goalkeeper like we could have done, um, it's best you take that, especially, Joe, um, after what came next. Um, I think it's fair to say that Manchester City put on a footballing masterclass in that first half. Uh, we couldn't get near the ball. Um, they were absolutely fantastic. And there are not many teams that Brighton will come up against um, that keep the ball as well as Manchester City do. Um, all early indications, though, Joe, were that Manchester City were given far too much time and space on the ball. Um, even before uh, we conceded a goal, there was a moment where City drove forward completely unopposed. Um, that man, Phil Foden, who loves to cause Brighton problems. Uh, Doku, he bent over the bar. Again, all because Brighton not closing down you know, not making life hard for Manchester City, which I felt was a theme in that first half. And this is, I'm going to come to it now because this is what me and Dagan were about to discuss before we came on air. And it irritates me. It irritates me that people are like, oh, it's Manchester City. It's a free hit. And I think that mentality needs to change. That mentality might have been good four or five years ago, but we have a coach that wants to drive us in a completely new direction. Uh, top six, top four. I think Manchester City are the best team in the world, or certainly one of the best team in the world. But that doesn't mean that we should make their jobs easier. Um, so I, for one, I'm quite irritated at our first half performance because I think we just made their lives far too easy. And I get 100% that they are world-class players um, in under a world-class coach. Again, I link it back to that doesn't mean you just need to sit there and make it easy for them, because at times I felt like it was just too easy for them, Joe. Uh, I think you're right in saying that um, because of the transition of this football club at the moment. And I think you see that transition in the mentality of the players as well, struggling to come to terms with actually we can compete. And they're almost in two minds. Do do I do I press now? Do I really show try and show myself, or do I go back to this conservative way of this is Manchester City? I need to give them a little bit of respect here and back off. Um, and I I think it's a mentality shift that Roberto De Zerbi is trying his absolute hardest to get across to his players. 
Um, and there absolutely have been moments where we've seen that on the pitch um, from from the players. And when you go to the Etihad, especially with, with Man City having just lost twice, there's that expectation on Manchester City to put on a performance for their fans because, as you say, Tom, they're probably one of the, if not the best team in the world right now. Um, so they're going to come out and they're going to cause us problems. So I'm I'm sort of half stuck in between the, yeah, you have to give our players a little bit of um, leeway because it's Man City, but also I completely see where you're coming from, Tom, where you're like, there's simple things that we were doing incorrectly, which would have alleviated a lot of pressure um, and, and, and allowed us to gain a little bit more of a foothold in the game. Um, so, yeah, I, I see both points of view, but I'm, I'm leaning more towards your, yours, Tom, because, as you say, there, there's really little simple things that just niggle away at you. Um, and if we correct those, we're really on our way to becoming such a, a fantastic footballing side. Yeah, Tom, I'd, I'd say the, the mindset issue, I'm I'm completely aligned with you. Like the, the mindset of folks are like, well, it's Man City and they're the best team in the world. We're we're aiming to be one of the best, you know, 10 clubs in the world, it seems. Um, and, you know, by a lot of metrics last year that measured teams quality, we were we were there, um, which I know people dismiss because, oh, it's just numbers. But I think the, the way that we played and how we produced uh, chances suggests that we are quite good. Um, I think yesterday's first half passivity, if you want to call it that, um, largely stems from <laughs> when you have two guys tasked with defending who simply cannot turn and run at the rate that the opponents can come at them. They ha We have to back off. We have to play more. You know, we can't play as aggressively, period. Um, and it, you know, so I think that the the team sheet, as much as Deserby may have wanted that pressure, I don't think these guys were capable of playing that way with the lineup we had on the pitch. Period. And again, I've, I've said before, if if Deserby has one sort of flaw, it's a little bit of hubris that I think and trust in his players. He has such belief in these guys and tries to instill such belief in them, but I think at times he's asking them to do things they just aren't capable or ready to do. Um, you know, Baleba is kind of an example of that for me. He's getting the chances now. He's really good on the ball. He's really good winning the ball, but he is not so good when he has to track back in a hurry and identify where the weak spots are and pick someone up. Because on our on the first goal conceded, and I know we're about to get there, um, you know, he had a big part in that. And I look forward to sort of talking about that particular play because I think that one moment was a microcosm of the issues that presented themselves the whole first half, it was just, you know, that was the one that ended up in the first goal. Yeah, let's let's, let's dive into it now then, shall we? Because, it, you know, uh, why not? Um, it all starts, Joe, as I've already sort of alluded to, uh, complete lack of pressing. And maybe Dagan's right. Maybe that's because with Gross and Milner on that right-hand side up against Doku, a player who's incredibly fast and he certainly gave them a very torrid time. Um, Gross just backs off. He just he allows him the freedom of the pitch, um, and Milner almost just becomes a total observer in in, in that passage of play. Um, and he Doku gets the ball to Alvarez, who, as Dagan is suggesting, is completely unmarked. Belaber is not picking up his, his man in the box, and Alvarez mishits it, but it goes in the back of the net. For me, Joe. That's a really sloppy goal to concede. No pressing in defence. A right back who's completely passive and a holding midfielder not picking up the runs of the Manchester City forward. What did you make of that? Um, you asked a question on Twitter, which I'm sure you're going to bring up a little bit later as well. Who plays at fullback um, in our crisis if Veltman is to play centre-half or left-back because of what we need and you include one option on there of pascal gross and i've had my sign pascal gross at right back um that against the correct opposition that he is absolutely fine there um however when you come up against the quality of man city he he had to do that role in that moment because milner was 
wherever Milner was, backing off, backing off, backing off. And Pascal Gross is like, I, I need to pick this man up. Pascal Gross gets cooked, whether it's Pascal's fault that he's he's made to be in that position by James Milner. He's dragged back because of that um, in, in capability um, of, of, of Milner's yesterday. And that's exactly where, where the issue comes from. And, you know, as you say about Belaber, he's he's such a young lad, so so much to learn, um, and he's learning the hard way and the fast way because he's been dropped into a, a Premier League side who qualified for Europe last season, lost Caicedo, and the expectations of that position are so incredibly high. Um, so I think, dependent on how Belaber reacts to this, this could either be a really fantastic lesson for him or it could just damage his confidence. And I hope it's the, the first one I say. Um, but what better way to learn is to, to get chucked into the deep end. And, um, you know, I'm sure De Zerbi's going to have his arm around him and say, look, this is what we can do better next time. Um, but yeah, it's just a just a, a lack of understanding and a lack of defensive awareness from from three players that really needed to be on it um in, in that moment and then and then we're one nil down and you know when you're one nil down at, at the Etihad against City you're always going to chase the game yeah yeah I'm I'm genuinely be- becoming increasingly concerned uh about our defense um Dagan, what were your views on the, the the first goal? You've already sort of mentioned Belaber. Um, what did you make of the uh, Doku run on the right hand side, which tied Pascal Gross up in knots and uh, pushed Milner back into being what just seemed like a casual observer? Yeah, Milner. I mean, Milner got caught. Well, Milner got caught a little bit out of position. Gross was able to sort of like come come in between Milner and Doku, so he ended up in that matchup with Milner dropping back. I think Milner correctly assessed that this was going to be a tough matchup for Gross, so he couldn't really pick up anybody else. He was more in a sort of a help position. Um, and as such, when Doku finally beat him on the end line, Milner did slide in and really to protect the this most simple cross is what it looked like to me, where the thought might have been that he would have been the one back in the in the path of Alvarez. But it really looked to me like Baleba just needed to take two more steps. He stopped I mean, he was sprinting and then just kind of stopped and watched the play um, and did not mark anyone. Uh, and it felt like that was that was on him um, for, for me. Because uh, I think Milner ended up in the right spot uh, to, to take away the easiest simple cross across the face of the goal. Um, although we had other defenders sort of in that line. But it, what Milner did there didn't look out of place or unusual to me. Um, but what Baleba did leaving that open space. And again, that's one of those places where that pass, that pass, I know he's at Chelsea. I know he's not our player anymore, but that pass doesn't reach Alvarez if Caicedo's on the pitch. It just doesn't. And there are differences between these two players. Baleba's still growing. He might get there. I don't think instinctively he's Caicedo. He, he's more offensive minded. I mean, one of the chances that Matoma ended up with was created after Baleba beat three or four guys himself with the ball a thing that we never saw Caicedo do in his time with us that I can recall uh, where he's bouncing off people and dribbling through people. He might beat one guy and then make the right pass, um, but he wasn't going to look to go on a foray, you know, across the pitch with the ball. Um, so look, I mean, uh, but it just makes you wonder uh, what, what we're capable of. And do we really, do we really have the guy that can cover for a weakness at right back? Like we covered for last year. And I think the answer is no. Um, yeah. You know, Lamptey gives us a ton of speed. Felton gives us physicality. Neither gives us, you know, both at the same time. Um, and when you look around at the best teams, that's what they have. They have guys who give you both for the most part. Um, if we yeah. want to be a top team, we have to have a right back and a left back of a top team. We have a left back of a top team, but he's hurt. Uh, and the question, you know, what do we do? Do we let's, go back three? Let's let's talk about that question now. Then, um, before we do though, um, because it seems to be tied in quite nicely to Belaber, I think the biggest mistake the club made this summer was uh, not bringing in fullback cover, um, and even further than that, I think the, one of the biggest mistakes the club have done over a number of years is not bringing a right back. Um, 
Tarek Lamptey is a phenomenal player when he's fit. He only plays about four times a year. Um, the last right back I can remember bringing in was maybe Montoya or Shalotto. So we're talking years ago. Um, we don't have a recognised right back at the club. And you people can say to their blue in the face that Veltman is a right back. He's not. He's a centre back playing out of position and he's very good at it. Um, but what we've seen, obviously, with this fixture congestion is a rotation of a back line. And Joel Veltman um, can't be expected to play all the time. Uh, Lamptey, unsurprisingly, is injured again. Um, so I put out a poll on on Twitter. I mean, I'm sorry, X, formerly known as Twitter, asking the people um, about who they would uh, play at right back when resting Joel Veltman. Um, and Joe, the answers have been categorical in that people want Pascal Gross at right back. That is what the people of X want. And now, we've seen Pascal Gross have phenomenal games at right back. And I'll hold my hands up and say that when he played at right back against Man United, and I want to say in the FA Cup semi uh, against Rashford, I was terrified before a ball was kicked, but he did really, really well. So he can play there very well. And I think he plays that inverted fullback role very nicely, bringing the ball into the midfield. But where Pascal perhaps lacks is that ability to, as Dagan said, to turn, run back and defend. Um, Joe, I have a feeling that you are one of the people that voted for Pascal Gross. Um, but are you of the opinion that Pascal could offer us something more than, say, someone like um, James Milner or Adam Webster? I think with Pascal, and yes, you're right, Tom, I did vote Pascal. Um, very well done. Um, I think he's he's one of the tr most trusted members of the squad, um, and his versatility is clear to be seen. If, if, if you can't see what Pascal gives us across the pitch, wherever he plays, then you really you need to take your FA coaching badges to, to see it. Um, I, yeah, I, I think with Pascal, it's, it's just the trust from the Zerbi to get a, a real good performance, um, out of there. And yeah, I, I, I'm sure Pascal is, is the first person to admit he's not the quickest at all. Um, and, and does have that, uh, limitation to playing that position, but his intelligence is second to none. Um, so for me, yeah, if, if you're asking me to pick a trusted member of the squad to, to give us at least a 7 out of 10 or a 6 out of 10, then you give it to Pascal Gross. Does that depend on the opposition, Joe? This has just popped into my head, this question. Um, yeah, that's something I said earlier. Um, and I, I think Pascal against, and I really don't want to disrespect people, but Pascal against, say, a Luton would, would work really well because we would have the majority of the ball and he would be able to do that role, as you say, the inverted fullback role and then bring himself into midfield and create another option and have the time um, and the freedom um, to, to, to get back if we're under the cosh at any point. Because I feel like Lewis Dunk, Igor, Webster, whoever might, might have been playing at that time would have been able to cover for him. Um, but if you're playing against Manchester City, Arsenal against Martinelli, Doku, Grealish, people like that, then then you worry a little bit more. But as you say, Tom, he, he's shown that he has the ability to defend against a, a really explosive type winger uh, in Marcus Rashford. So I think it's just a case of what Pascal Gross do you get on the day? And you normally, 95% of the time, get a very, very well-rounded Pascal Gross. Um, so that's so yes opposition does matter but i think opposition matters whichever player you are in wh whichever game to be honest um so as i say even considering that pascal gross is the option that is fair dagan just really quickly um who would you play at right back if veltman was not available i i did vote for gross um of those three and i thought about it and I think I, I alluded to it a minute ago, the fact that that would open up the midfield for a Baleba gilmore duo was why I made that choice. Um, because I think that that duo 
is, is promising and we don't get to see a lot of them because gross is usually in the midfield too. Um, so moving him to right back allows him to be, you know, sort of the master of ceremonies that he can be out there. Uh, the maestro, if you will, Pascal gross. Um, but let's, you know, let's those other two who are, who are speedier uh, scoot around and perhaps provide the cover. My other, my caveat to gross at right back is dunk needs to be at right center back. He, he saved individually a number <laughs> of, of chances yesterday, single-handedly. Um, I mean, I thought in a game where, you know, we had some low moments, he really cleaned up a lot of the messes for us. And so I think if he's there as that immediate line of cover, uh, that helps uh, because he snuffs out some of the, some of the chances before they become dire. Um, and then, you know, I think Igor has looked pretty good, you know, since the, since the sort of free kick issues at Athens, at, at, he hasn't made a lot of mistakes. Um, he may give away some needless fouls on occasion, uh, but you live with that. Um, so, yeah, you know, different scenarios. I could see Van Hecke right back. I could see Webster right back. Um, who's our other option in that trio? Mel. No, no. <laughs> Oh, no, it's not an option. That's that is a non-option. Um Gully. It's it's a non-option, especially when Gross is in the midfield too. And and I think, you know, it, it seems pretty definitive that Gross is is necessary out there. Um and and if that is the case, I just don't think you can play the two of them together. So for me, what Milner is Milner is a sub only option. Um and I would say that's, you know, maybe Gross comes off too. Uh, but uh, it sure would be nice to have guys who play the position. At, at the risk of prolonging this this point, I would like to see Adam Webster um, at right back, and I'll quickly tell you for why. Um, we saw him at his best um, in a back three under Graham Potter, bringing the ball out of defence. Um, we know that he's quite good with the ball at his feet, Adam Webster. Um, he's a natural defender, which gives him perhaps a bit more defensive nous than Milner and Gross. Um, so, yeah, why not? If you're going to play an inverted fullback that's going to run in with the ball into the midfield, to me, that screams Adam Webster. Um, but anyway, um, we're considering we're going to be talking about the left back spot a bit later in the program. Um, we will uh, hastily move on because otherwise we'll be here forever. Um, it didn't take very long for Manchester City to double their lead, Joe. Um, a pretty poor throw-in routine. Um, saw um, a mistake in possession by Balaba. Another mistake in possession, not by Balaba, but I'm very sure that this week I saw a statistic about goals conceded after turnovers and Brighton were at the near the top, if not at the top of that list. If you remember, same thing happened against Liverpool. Uh, we lost possession, we got hit, and they scored. Um, similar situation today, Balaba, um lost the ball um, from March's throw. Haaland drove forward, and I don't want to be too critical of... I'm not going to be critical of Dunk, because as, as Dagan said, there's um, he did very well. Um, but I think Haaland used Dunk's body position very well to maybe catch Steele unsighted. And it was a, a fantastic um, shot. But Haaland, again, given the time and space to take aim and pull the trigger, Joe, um, was it a frustrating goal to concede or was it just Haaland being Haaland? No, because we gave Haaland that chance. Um, we lose the ball from your own throw in, which is basic ridiculous and then you've got a couple of players that a ball's played unwillingly maybe by Sonny March because he's put under the pressure and you've got two players that don't react quick enough and then you've got Haaland breathing down your neck behind you it's going to spell trouble every single time um and it doesn't surprise me that we're near the top of the list if not at the top of the list for goals conceded after a turnover because that's exactly what we've seen over the last few weeks, few months even, is that we don't react quick enough. Um, and then you've got Lewis Dunk and whoever his centre-back partner may be scrambling. And, and when you're scrambling against 
Erling Haaland, who is the best centre forward in the world, um, it's going to end badly and it ended badly. Um, I just want to say, we were talking about Lewis Dunk. I just want to put in here, it's completely random, but to congratulate Lewis Dunk on his England Man of the Match award against Australia because it just proves, again, how bloody good that man is. Yeah, he's a fantastic player. And as Dagan's rightfully pointed out, if it wasn't for Lewis Dunk yesterday, um, the scoreline could have been uh, a, a lot worse. Uh, Dagan, thoughts on that, that second goal? Brighton, once again, poor in possession, sloppy with the ball, um, and it leads instantaneously to another goal conceded. The label looked crushed. I mean, he, he like, uh, and part of me wonders if it's, because he didn't also recognize or hadn't been told he had a hand in that first goal. Um, and then to, so, you know, sort of obviously give away that second chance, but I, I blame him less for the second one than the first one. Um, because the, the second one was an error of, of body, not of mind. I thought the error of mind there was Sally, which is pretty inexcusable to me. I mean, he played a chunky, bouncy, tough to handle, hard hit ball to Baleba, who was pretty close to him on the side of Silva who got his foot in and Baleba had to rush that touch or he's going to give it away anyway. Um, if you'd have played it on the goal side of Baleba, if Sally had played it on the, on the goal side of Baleba, Baleba could have turned his back and probably played it back to steel or, you know, done something. But as it was, the ball was out in front of him sort of free for either him or Silva. He tried to sort of extend his leg and play it and it, he just made a mess of it. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I really feel like Sally put him in a really bad spot and he didn't make it any better. Um, and then that's what happens. Like the, the, the randomness of the sport, it's, it's exacerbating, right? Because, you know, as good as city was the way that they scored really had nothing to do with how good they were and had to do with us making a mistake, but you know, that they, they were really good. And I, and I do want to add like for, for the thought as you mentioned, Tom, and we were we were about to get in debate on before we started, as you said, you were talking about that Wolves result, right? Where, you know, uh, City fell to Wolves. Um, four different players, well, there were more than four, but four key different players in the lineup to yesterday. They had Rodri, who they didn't have in that game. They had Stones, who they didn't have in that game. Uh, they had Vardiol, who they didn't have in that game. Uh, and Silva, who they didn't play in that game. Uh, and and to me, those four players yesterday, you know, obviously aside from from their goal scores, just they made a huge impact. Uh, I mean, there was a time in the, early in the second half where Vardiol, you know, went on a run and ended up on the right, on like the right wing from the left back spot. Like what what City does with the versatility of their players is is incredible. Um, and so, you know, on one hand, you look at a game against them away and think we conceded two goals, and one of them was sort of a dumb accident. Like it's hard to say we were awful. We just weren't to me. We weren't good enough yesterday. Um, but I don't feel like we were terrible. I just feel like we had some bad lineup choices and then weren't quite good enough to beat the best team in the world or, or draw with them. I do th certainly think it was a, a game of two halves. Um, in that first half, especially it did feel like Brighton were chasing shadows but on the flip side of that, I do think that when City had the ball, Brighton gave them too much respect, too much time and space. And then when Brighton did have it, they just kept giving it away so cheaply. And that has been a real bugbear of mine this season. And if it was just an isolated event against Manchester City, then, yeah, of course, you could use the, oh, but it's Manchester City. They're the best team in the world excuse. But when you're also doing that against Luton and, you know, Wolves, where Wolves were at the time, then it speaks to a a larger problem with ball retention for me. And that has been one of my big, big issues this season. Um, just before we kind of end the half um, analysis, uh, one thing we haven't touched on there, Joe, is Danny Welbeck uh, coming off with what looked like a hamstring injury to be replaced by Evan Ferguson. Um, no news as of yet that I'm aware of, um, of how bad the injury is um, and how long we can expect Welbeck to be off for, um, Joe, but um, a blow to what is becoming an increasingly injured squad. Uh, yeah, at least of my worries in terms of the striker department, I think 
we are okay. Tom's disappeared. He's back. <laughs> that really confused me. Um, yeah, I, I think obviously it's gotten to see Welbeck injured. You, you, you never wish an injury on anyone, um, but I, I think we'll be okay. Jal Pedro, Evan Ferguson, Ansu Fati, who can all play in that position. Um, but yeah, those numbers on the injury list and the injury that we're about to talk about as well, uh, which I might cry during. Um, not good. <laughs> not good at all. No, really not good. And um, yeah, we'll get to that that in a bit. I think as bad as yesterday was in the first half and has frustrated I, as I was by that first half, the major, um, the worst part of yesterday wasn't actually the result at all. It was the injury to, to Solly March um, that he sustained in the second half. And you know, I really hope that um, it's not as bad as it looks. It looks to be a potential ACL, um, which means he could be out for the rest of the season. Um, so we wish Solly um, all the best and hope it's a, a speedy, speedy recovery. Um, a very important player, Dagan, under Roberto De Zerbi, um, not only for the threat he gives the Albion in attack, but also his versatility and the ability to, to be played in defence, which he's had to do uh, in the wake of Purvis's injury. Yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, I, I thought he was strong again yesterday in that role. Um, I mean, Foden didn't really get the best of him, uh, which is, you know, not not an unimpressive achievement. Um, that's a really difficult phrase there, but uh, it was an impressive achievement uh, to, to me, the degree to which he kept Foden in check. Um, <clears throat> I thought Foden in his frustration, probably deserved at least one yellow over the course of the game because he protested every single non-call um, that was that was made uh, or not made. Um, yeah, it it's a huge loss. It's going to open up some opportunities that may not have otherwise been there because Sally is, you know, as regular a player as we have. Um, yeah. I know is is the next question about fixture congestion. Is that what we're talking about? You can um, talk about it if you want. Well, I was I because I was reflecting on that as I was reading the notes, and I don't I wouldn't attribute these injuries to that given the level of rotation that we've had. The wear and tear of the number of games that some of the guys who played almost every game last year had coming into this year, I, I'd maybe be curious about that impact sort of the long overtime, but not so much the immediate fixture congestion because this year we've really been rotating the guys and we're coming off, you know, two weeks of a break. Uh, and yeah. Uh, how to replace them. I don't know. Is it more Dingra hopefully in CISO is back in December, but that's still, you know, a month's worth of games away at least. Uh, yeah. It's going to be, do we see fatty some on the right or, or, or do we see, uh, Jao Pedro, maybe play outside. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know who gets slotted in over there, but it, he's he's going to be tough to replace. Deserby likes a left-footed right winger, and he's the only one we have. Um, I don't think we're putting Igor out there. <laughs> Bale Baleba at right wing. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that's the answer either. Um, goodness gracious. It, it Yeah, I, I agree with Joe. I, I think we'll be okay at striker. Um it's going to be really interesting in January if, you know, if we enter January with roughly the number of injuries we have now, I would think there would be a lot of impetus to make some moves. Yeah, I think one of the biggest impetus is, unfortunately, it's not even the role that Solly is supposed to be playing in, um, Joe. It's actually the left back position um, with Purvis's injury and no date set for his return. Uh, Solly, as Dagan said, has had to, you know, adjust we've seen Solly play left wing back before and he's done a very good job he did a great job against Liverpool a good job against Manchester City um and obviously the most important thing here is of course Solly his well-being um which is which is really hard to see um given his uh, longevity in the squad um but of course it gives us all sorts of headaches now um with who you play at left back uh, what do you make of the whole situation, Joe? So, uh, Solly himself and, of course, the uh, the problems that this will give Roberto De Zerbi when selecting a left-sided fullback. Yeah. Um, I, I think 
Solly's spirited performances at left back against Liverpool and for the majority of the game that he played yesterday, I think it's so clear to see that if 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 there are still Solly March doubters, that he is one of the best footballers at our football club. He is absolutely fantastic. Um, whatever role you ask him to do, his attitude is second to none. His work rate is off the charts. Um, and there is no denying what he's given this football club from the moment he, he arrived as a, as a young lad um, into Oscar Garcia's side from the under 23s burst onto the scene um, and, you know, is, is, is given so much and it's really heartbreaking to see a player, to see any player go down like that, but extra heartbreaking, I think, because it's Solly. Um, and yeah, the, it's, it's all a massive like snowball of, issues <laughs> in terms of what this Solly March injury means. It means you lose, as I say, one of the best footballers in the squad. You lose an option, a, a left-footed option at right wing, and you lose a fantastic option at left back, possibly even right back as well. Um, and it's just, it couldn't happen to a better professional. Um, and I really, really, really am praying that it's not as bad as we as we fear. But it's it's a it's a scrambling of of hope that Solly is okay. But I I really think it's not good news. Yeah, and I'm seen... I'm absolutely gutted. Yeah, we've seen Solly sustain a, a knee injury before. Um, which I believe kept him out for about a year. I'm hopeful that it isn't the same knee. I don't know if that makes it better or worse. I, I, I really don't know. Um, but it's a, a huge, huge loss for the club and a huge, um, you know, hugely sad for Solly himself. Dagan. Well, I was just going to say the thought I had yesterday after after the injury and then watching the, the next game with Chelsea was uh, seeing Cole Palmer be Chelsea's best player, which he has looked for the bulk of his time on the pitch that we've seen him. Uh, that feels like a big miss. And I don't know how close that really was to happening, but it certainly was rumored for a time. And you know, I was I was excited about that possibility. 40 million seemed like a big price tag, but it doesn't look like a big price tag watching what he's doing for Chelsea because he's really transformed their attack completely. And, uh, you know, at the time, it seemed like a real luxury to have that extra left-footed right-winger when we were looking at Kudus and and Palmer. Uh, but now now it looks like another, you know, I don't want to say gaping hole because we've got some guys who are capable, but none of them are left-footed. And that, you know, is definitely Deserby's preference. So that, and again, that worries me about, is that another point of frustration with him? And you never know the inner workings inside the club, but if it was something he was pushing for and we didn't get because – you know, we only had a certain amount that we were going to spend or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's disappointing. My worry is more about the lack of cover at right back and what Solly can do there. Um, I, I'm really not bothered about our attacking options. I think we have more than enough. Um, but it's just how well we know Solly can do there is is just extra gutting. Yeah. Yeah, I think our uh, options at both fullback positions are very poor. Um would would we like I, I don't I need to do some deserving research to see if he's ever done this, but would he go to a back three? He played a back three in our first game, but I think that was more to do with him coming into a new squad of players um, and basically saying what you've done before, go and do it again. Um from what I know of Deserby, I think he's reluctant to go to a back three. He likes his system um with the the two holding midfielders in front of a back four because it gives you the box shape in the middle of the park um, and your three-man passing lanes. Um, so I, I can't see it personally. Um, again, I put out a poll on X and the majority of people, 69.4%, say Igor to fill in at left back, which is, I suppose, the only sensible option given, he, given he's a left footer. Um, 
it, it hits me now, guys, that we haven't actually mentioned the the, the second half at all. Um, so we best we best do that as we're we're on fifty minutes around that time. Um, so let's start off by just quickly mentioning that uh, at halftime, Joel Veltman came on, thankfully for James Milner, who had a torrid first half. And we spoke earlier about well, Dagan spoke earlier about being physical early on. There was a lovely moment earlier on where Veltman and Doku uh, had a coming together, shall we say, and then of. Veltman, of course, was all, oh, I'm very, very sorry for that. Very sorry. He knew what he was doing. He was saying to Doku, you know that fun time you had in the first half? Yeah, I ain't getting that again. Um, for me, that Joel is Joel Veltman, one yeah. of the nicest blokes in football, right? I, I think anyone that's met him can vouch for, for that and, and say that. But on the pitch, oh, my God. <laughs> I love it. He's a master of the dark arts. He knows what he's doing. Um, and yeah, it was uh, it was really nice to see that we actually had some uh, defensive stability on the right hand side. Um, and we actually, as we have been doing recently, um, we started the second half very, very well. Um, some early opportunities. Simona Dingra gets his head up and he played in Pascal Gross, um, who probably took a touch too many. And his shot eventually goes wide. I personally felt, Joe, that he Pascal probably should have done better there. Um, am I being harsh or or do you agree? No, I agree. Um, I think him turning around and complaining to whoever he complained to um, was was a little bit of a uh, a mask for for, for something that um, he absolutely knows he can do better at. Um, you can see from the slow mo replay um, on on the highlights that it he, he completely lost balance and and didn't take the shot as well as he can. Um, I, yeah, it's one of those chances where. It, you, you would hope he would do better at, but it was good to see that we were starting to create chances. <laughs> yeah. And it's definitely a, a running theme day, Dagan about, you know, maybe having a poor first half we saw against Bournemouth, Marseille, um, not so much against Liverpool, but definitely towards you know the end of the first half against Liverpool. Um, but that's the difference between the sides really, isn't it? The quality to take chances when they come Man City, as you said, they didn't really, you know their goals wasn't weren't born out of their own brilliance. It was more of our def- defensive mistakes, um, and Brighton were perhaps guilty of spurning some chances when they did come. Um, but we did see some some wonderful work. You've already mentioned about Matoma, who had a lovely uh, chance. Um, it's worth just mentioning quickly that Fatty did came up, come on the pitch as a second half substitute, and he changed the game. Um, and the chance I'm going to talk about now actually was a proper counter attack. We don't see uh, many of those. Fantastic save from Steele from Haaland's shot. Um, Mitoma, though, went down the other end of the pitch. It was a lovely little dink from Fatty um, after a great pass from Dunk. Um, and Mitoma, with the goalkeeper off his line, hits the ball straight at him. Um, a frustrating one, Dagan, because we've seen Mitoma go for a cheeky lob in the past, a cheeky chip. Um, were you disappointed that Matoma didn't make the most of that opportunity? Well, it's certainly the type of shot that we've seen him convert in the past. Um, Ortega did well, for sure. Um, but Matoma didn't make life on him as tough as he might have been able to. Walker and Stones were both charging hard, and had it been a delicate chip, they may have gotten there. Um, watching it back because I did watch it back after I saw the question in your notes just to see, you know, could it have been bothered by those guys? Cause they were, they were flying. Um, but I do think, you know, trying to chip it over and probably was the, was the play. Uh, I, I, I want to go back to the ball that dunk sent to un- unlock that play because it, it's the kind of pass that I wish we would try more often. Um, because it was so direct uh, and against a team like City that is dominating the middle of the park, being able to sort of play over the top of them into space, it takes a special pass to do it. Um, But at least you're not giving the ball away in a terribly risky spot if you do that versus trying to thread it through them. Um, To your point earlier, Tom, about giving the ball up, you know, so easily, like if you give it up on a long ball, you know, they're at least in their half when they take over possession. Uh, but it was just a beautifully weighted ball from Dunk and then an incredibly creative ball from from Fatty on the, you know, that loop over the top to Matoma that also was, you know, well-weighted and, and lovely to look at. Uh, but yeah, that 
that spark of creativity was exciting and gave us, you know, one of our best chances. Uh, and again, you only get so many in these games, but you know, so, yeah, I, I know they're, they're vulnerable just like anyone else, but city city did put out, I think their best lineup absent the keeper um, and Ortega didn't hurt them. So hard to, hard to say anything about it, but otherwise I really think they had their best 10 outfield players playing today. And, you know, they don't do that every game. That's I think, and I think that's a sign of respect to us. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair comment. Um, you know, what they they call the the the, the Pep is known for tinkering with his side, but you know they he they did put out a, a strong eleven, as you say. So maybe I am being very harsh with my <laughs> critique here. Um, but I suppose it's because I just know that we can do so much better when playing the simple things. Um, but for all of my bemoaning of defensive errors, it was actually a defensive error, Joe, uh, from Manchester City uh, that helped Brighton score. Matoma running at the City defence. Um, he put the ball in. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a clearance or if it just hit his leg. The Man City defender, though, plays the ball into Fatty, who finishes well. And Brighton if nothing else, keep their scoring streak alive and well. And it was that man, Ansu Fati, who, just as Dagan's already said, Joe, offered a bright spark in that second half. Yeah, and I feel like Ansu Fati, uh, his goals uh, and the um, the ability to change the way uh, we, we look going forwards sort of gets squished down a little bit because the two goals that he scored for us have been... One, obviously, against Aston Villa, which we won't talk about. Um, and yesterday um, could have gone very differently, um, but it's in a loss. The two goals have come in a loss. And I, <clears throat> I I go back to that moment he came on against United for his first appearance for us and, and that chance he had to score to make it 4-1. Um, I feel like would have propelled him even more and made people realise actually what a fantastic player we have in Ansu Fati. Um, I thought as well, I don't know if it's just me, but I thought that he looked a little bit stockier yesterday. I don't know if he's been putting in some work in the gym because he's found out how physical the Premier League is, but he, he looked a little bit more physical, um, which which is something I really wanted to see from him. Um so hopefully going into Ajax, he can he can start the game um, and have a real impact and and, and win us the game because I I think he's that type of player that could could win you the game single handedly, um, and uh, yeah I, I really hope to see that. Yeah, fingers crossed. I think he's a a very exciting young talent, um, and he certainly you know got Brighton believing uh, towards the end there. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be even when Manchester City went down to 10 men after a Kanji was given a second yellow card. Brighton couldn't quite uh, get that equalised. It was frustrating, Dagan, at the death there. Brighton have a set piece, um, which has been another bugbear of mine this season, attacking set piece, which is played short. Gilmore then lofts in a beautiful ball to the back post. But no one's there. Um, and in the what the ninety something minute after injuries, or what? Why? Why is there no one there? Nick why? Stanley, clear your locker out, mate. You're gone. I just Sorry. it's just frustrating. You know, I'd send blooming Jason the steal up when it's that because at the end of the day, you're going to you know worst case scenario they get the ball, they get down the pitch, and it's three one. But you know, best case scenario, you manage to get get an equalizer in the last minute. I just I don't understand that you've got a set piece in the, the the dying moments of a game and you just you play the ball short or you 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 after Billy Gilmore puts in a lovely ball no one's there to attack it Dagan a frustrating end to what was otherwise you know a, a good half I thought you know Brighton were were very good Manchester City seemed to be tiring at times um but ultimately it was the first half display that cost us yeah I uh, I'd love to see Gilmore on more set pieces. He took one and he hit just a heavy, heavy ball. Um, yeah. I just like to see maybe just more variety on who's taking those. Um, but yeah, Gilmore, Gilmore has some creativity and yeah. I mean, Pascal gross does too. Uh, but yeah, Gilmore's not going to win many balls in the air. That's for sure. Um, 
And so having him as the taker probably gives us, you know, Gross is a bigger guy uh, and, and taller than Gilmore by quite a bit. Um, probably not going to sky up for a lot of headers, but uh, anyway, um, it, it was disappointing. You know, there was that brief like, oh my gosh, could we, could we steal a point here? Could, could we steal a point? Uh, which is, which is fun. And I mean, to be in that position is, I, I think, a testament to the quality of this team. You know, we're, we're looking at a, a five game winless streak now. Um, but we played against one of the best teams in the world and had a chance to walk away with the point, you know, in the dying minutes of the game. That's, it's not a terrible result. Um, you know, in this run of games has, has been against a lot of really tough opponents um, while we're battling a rash of injuries. So the fixture strength seems to turn here um, where we're going to see some opponents like Fulham that traditionally give us fits, but a team that we probably should walk away with three points against. Um, I feel like our season hinges on the next five games. Uh, And here we are depleted as we've been at any point in the past year and a half. Just say that. It's very true. I don't think I can recall. Maybe it was Potter's, the Christmas, um, or the New Year, I should say, in Potter's last full season. That's about the last time I can remember a time where we were perhaps as depleted in terms of our injury numbers. Now, Joe, just really, really quickly, a quick question just in regards to the Man City game. You know, Dagan saying there about, you know, being in the chance to to, to score an equaliser at the last minute in the Etihad um, and finishing the game 2-1 is perhaps, you know, not the worst result in the world. Um, I think that's certainly true when you look at it on paper. But when you when you see the, the mistakes that Brighton made um, in the first half defensively, are, are Brighton fans... Well, the Brighton fans who are wanting more, uh, do you think they're wrong for doing that? I mean, I've certainly come in for my share of stick, not necessarily nasty stick at all, um, but generally sort of a, the questioning of, but it's Man City. Did you honestly expect to beat Man- Manchester City? Um, so again, I link it back to that question I mentioned earlier about the shifting in mentality. Are Brighton fans wrong for wanting more out of a game against the best team in the world? I'll ask you the question in a different way, Tom. Are Brighton fans wrong for wanting their football club to win and succeed? No. There you go. No. No, it's, think, it's ridiculous. I, 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 as I say, I don't want to say it because we've already spoken about it. I do think the result on paper, 2-1 against Manchester City at the Etihad, isn't too bad. But I think when you actually look at the game, especially that first half, especially the goals we conceded, I can certainly understand where some frustration is coming from from some fans thinking we've we've sh- once again it's, we've shot ourselves in the foot it's incredibly disappointing because we expect so much from our football club and that's not a bad thing um however you can also look at it a different way and say it's really positive thing that we are walking away from the etihad saying wow if we hadn't have made those mistakes, we could have got something from that game and as you guys have been saying for this whole time it's testament to where this football club is right now um, that we can walk away and say that. Um, you're right, Tom, four, five years ago, I think you said this earlier, um, we would have had that mentality of, wow, 2-1 at the Etihad. What, what a fantastic club we are. Wow, I'm so happy with that result. And um, now we're saying we're not because we know we can do better. Um, and it's it's a great time to be a Brighton fan. We haven't won a game in, in what, five, five, six games um, or five, I think it's five now. Um, But, you know, we're not sat here like uh, a Manchester United would and say, oh, it's the end of our football club. Uh, You know, the the sky is falling down. Um, Everything's going wrong. Sack the board, sack the manager, sack this person. We know that there's a journey to go on um, and we're living the journey. Um, so pff, whatever, I, I'm, I'm just, just here for the vibes, man. <laughs> You're right. And talking of journeys, Dagan, that journey continues on Thursday where we host European giants, Ajax, um, at the Amex stadium. Ajax, of course, synonymous with Johan Cruyff, who is the man who taught Pep Guardiola. Um, so you know, a nice little, um, 
parallel there. Um, Ajax, though, at the moment, not the force they once were, having a bit of a torrid time over in the area of Um What do you expect out of this game on Thursday? Expect a rock and Amex. That's what I expect. Uh, you know, it's got it's yeah, it's a huge game for our Europa League chances. Ajax is now winless in eight, um, so they're having a rougher time than we are. They've lost three out of their last four. Um, today they lost four three after the game was stopped at three all with their fans reportedly throwing things onto the pitch. Um, I don't have the exact details of all of that, but the sort of interactions with their fans have certainly been tough. There's a lot of unrest. Um, and hopefully we can capitalize on that. We, we didn't with Marseille who had the sort of new, new manager bounce. Um, but let's hope we, let's hope we bounce back. I'm, I'm optimistic about this one. Joe, do you share Dagan's optimism and is a, anything but a win at the Amex, um, all but a disaster for Albion's first foray into Europe. All I hope, Tom, is it's not as bloody wet as it was against Athens because I got drenched. I I, th- I think my clothes from that day are still wet. There's just water everywhere. And I don't like it. Um, yes, I expect us to, to come out strongly. Um, and I, I think Athens was, boom, you're in Europe. This is what you've got to deal with. I don't think Ajax will be as such a surprise for us. Our first home game, obviously, against Athens was was big. But now I think we're like, okay, we're on the European stage. Um, Here we are. There's time to arrive now. We've got the opportunity to really go for a club that are in disarray um, and score some goals because Ajax are shipping goals like you wouldn't believe. Um, and if we don't bloody score against them, Tom, <laughs> I should be so annoyed. Um, so yeah, um, I think it's really exciting to go into this game and, and to, to really expect to beat one of the m- biggest names in European football um, and, and, and propel us on to qualifying for the next stages of the Europa League. Um, and uh, you, you're reeling off all these facts about... Uh, Johan Cruyff, uh, Tom. Did you know that Pascal Gross taught Johan Cruyff the uh, the Pascal Gross turn? Um, I had heard a rumor. <laughs> he got a time machine, went back to the 1970s, and was like, "Sup, I've got this idea. You should try it out." Um, Dagan, I think it's fair to say that in our past European uh, two European games, we've played the occasion rather than the game. Do you hope that, as it's now our third game in the Europa League, that we've sort of gotten over the fact that we're there um and now it's time to really sort of put in the hard work and get a win yeah i think absolutely i think this is this this is the time right we've we've had the shock shock and awe of our first experience and and sort of laid an egg a little bit um and then we had you know our second game where tough tough circumstance i think we were shell shocked by the away atmosphere uh, and then rallied and got a point out of it. And, you know, now I think we're, we're ready to show uh, the real Brighton, as Roberto De Zerbi is fond of saying. Um, I asked to Joe's point, they have conceded 17 goals in their last six games. Um, so they have, they How have, many have been... we conceded. Oof. In our last six? Lots. Uh, it's going to be a goal fest, isn't it? It's going to be an absolute goal fest. Eight Whoa. goals. Well, we've got a six goal allowed game in there, but let's see our last six. One, two, eight, 10, 12, 14. But I mean, if you look at our opponents and their opponents, uh, there's a, there's a difference. Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But if I go back, they, they have played, they have conceded. Uh, I'm going to butcher these names. They three to FC Twent, 20, uh, three to Marseille, four to Feyenoord, one to Athens, two to AZ uh, Al- Alkmaar, and then four to FC Utrecht. Not not Liverpool and City and Chelsea and Villa in that stretch of teams. I know some of those teams are, are good Eredivisie teams um, and should be respected, but... 
it will certainly be an interesting one to watch. It is the game that I am perhaps looking forward to the most. I'm a big fan of the history of Ajax and Johan Cruyff, who's um, just um, you know a, a, a technical genius of the game, one of the best to ever play the game and certainly one of the best to ever coach uh, the game. So it's a game that I'm really looking forward to. Um, and let's just hope that, as I say, that we play the game and not the occasion and we manage to get our first win in the Europa League. Now, just before we sign off, Joe, you'd like to say a few words. I would. Um, the first of the few words is to um, just firstly send our support and love to Brian Horton, um, who has just recently announced um, that he is uh, going through treatment for prostate cancer. We really hope that it's the, the, the best possible news and he can come through that. Um, and of course, uh, the sad passing of Jerry Ryan. We send our condolences to his family and friends as well. I'm sure there's lots of Albion fans who are listening to this. Um, who could tell us many, many stories of of him playing for the Albion. Um, so we just wanted to pass on our sympathies to to, to those as well. Um, and as well in the uh, WSL, we've just taken on uh, a blog called She Goals um, on X. If you want to follow them, it's at She Goals. Um, and they do fantastic blogs about everything WSL. And, and we'll post everything uh, once they have a new um, article out. So um, if you're listening to this podcast, it's being released probably on the Monday after the Albion women have played and hopefully beaten Chelsea. Um, so, yeah, if you wanted to hop over to, to, to their page, um, you'll, you'll see it on there. Um, and Tom, did you want to do the one clock shop thing? Of course, I do like a good football shirt. I've just bought one uh, myself, <clears throat> uh, a retro 90s Birmingham shirt. I know, it's Birmingham. I, Birmingham, you're a Brighton fan. Ooh. You plastic. But it right. is the 1992 shirt. It looks like an old bus seat cover, and I blooming loves it. Um, if you too have a certain love for vintage football shirts, you should check out One Clop Shop. Link in the description below and use code Albion Obsessed, all one word, all capital letters, and you can get 10% off your order. So go check those guys out if you're into football shirts. Dagan, you've just posted in the chat and it seems very fitting considering what we've talked about today in terms of fullback strength. Purvis Estupinian is rumoured to be returning around November the fourth that is certainly news good news for the remember Alabama. remember the fourth of november oh no that's the wrong when thing purvis estupanyan came back yes let's hope certainly that uh purvis's return is speedy and uh he doesn't get any further injury setbacks and of course once again we hope that solly march uh, makes a very quick recovery thank you for listening guys thank you for watching as ever don't forget to like share and subscribe for more content if you haven't done so already but until next time wherever you may be whenever you may be we'll see you soon take care bye bye <laughs>